All right, ready to rock. Here we go. Welcome, everybody, back to Monday Night Jewish Essentials, the greatest hour of the work week in the greatest place in South Florida. Yes, yes. Sing it loud, sing it proud. Tonight we're talking about the Jewish belief in guardian angels, whether Jews believe in guardian angels, uh, what our general concept of angels uh, might be, and what practical meaning it has in our lives. Sound like fun? Yeah. All right. So we have to know, first of all, that the Jewish belief in angels in general goes all the way back since Judaism's inception. The belief is from the beginning. Angels are seen as emissaries of God, and they're dispatched to carry out God's will. That's their job. That's what they're there for. In fact, the Hebrew word that's used for angel, the general term used for angel, malach, comes from the same root as the word to send, right? Someone who is sent, something that is sent. So a malach, an angel, is some, someone that is sent for a purpose by God, a divine purpose. So the sole purpose of an angel the single purpose of an angel is the task that God assigns to it. That is what an angel is about. So angels are mentioned numerous times throughout the Torah, throughout the prophets, throughout the writings, throughout rabbinic literature, and we're going to go through some of them tonight as the evening continues. Now it's important to break the stereotype, though, of the angel as being some winged baby that you know has a halo and floats on a cloud and plays the harp and you know it, it, that's that's the that, that's the imagery of an angel one of the things one of the most confusing things for the jewish community as a whole is breaking our misconceptions about what we believe and what we don't believe one of the one of the one of the places that you see that it has an issue is when the primary imagery that we have of the concept is is brought out in Christian sources. So, for example, a lot of Jews will say, like, "Well, Jews don't believe in hell." Well, that's not true. It's not the Christian concept of hell, but there is a place that a person that a that a soul will, is. You know, a, their sins are atoned for. That, but it's more of a purgatory and it's more of a cleansing experience. There is a concept, though, that it's not all about. You know, that, you, that there's a, a step before getting to the heavenly realms. That there's a place where a person feels the the suffering of the you know stains that they may have caused on their soul throughout their life. There is such a concept. That's a Jewish concept of hell. Again, it's not the way that it's looked at in other faiths, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that Jews don't believe in hell because they have a different concept. So when, when the question is presented, do Jews believe in hell, for example, the, the, the return question, which is also Jewish, right? Jews always answer a question with a question. So if somebody asks you, do Jews believe in hell? You have to say, well, what do you mean by hell? What are you talking about? If what you're talking about is the way that it's in Dante's Inferno, maybe not. But if the, what you're talking about is a place where a person feels uh, the you know, pain and fear, experiences some sort of spiritual or emotional suffering based on the actions that they did throughout the course of their life, you know, albeit temporarily, but there is, there is very much such a thing. So again, the idea in Judaism, when it comes to any spiritual concept, we have to make sure that we're breaking out of the imagery that we usually associate with it. Angels are, at the end of the day, spiritual beings. They're devoid of any sort of physical characteristics. Any descriptions that are used in Jewish literature which describe angels uh, either having wings or limbs or whatever it is are purely anthropomorphic. It's giving human terms to a spiritual concept. And any time we use anthropomorphic terminology, we always must remember that the language that we're using is being used to convey something that we can relate to it. In other words, since these are purely spiritual ideas, 
in order for me, who can only relate to things that I've had sensory experience with, that I've seen or touched or heard in my life, the, the language that's used has to convey a, a it, it's conveying some sort of spiritual premise about the, what we're talking about, but using physical terms. So for example, when the when Torah te texts will talk about an angel having wings, when an angel is mentioned that it has wings, it's not saying that angels actually have wings. It's not like a, it's not like a bird or a, a baby with wings on it. It's not what it means. Okay? When we say things like wings, we mean in the same way that physical wings carry an entity higher and higher, the purpose of the wings that is that it can fly higher, so too the whole existence of an angel is to constantly go higher and higher spiritually. And so an angel having wings, again, and we're not assigning physical terminology, we're, 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 only, we're only assigning physical terminology. We're not saying that an angel actually has wings because an angel is not a physical creature. An angel is an entity, a, a, a portal of existence that conveys God's uh, message or energy to the world. It's not a person. It's not a person with wings. It's not a baby with wings. There's no halos, none of that stuff. It's cute in the cards or whatever, but we have to make sure to separate our mind from that type of imagery because it's incorrect. It's not correct. Okay? Now, so this does not mean a form in a physical sense. Anytime we are describing the form, it's not talking about a form in a physical sense. Instead, a spiritual manifestation of different types of divine energy. That's what these angel creatures, entities are. So far so good? Good. Now, interestingly, the Bible describes the frenzied running and returning, the constant fluctuation of the angels, the state of existence that the angels are constantly going to and fro. They're going to and fro in the presence of God. And the Kabbalists write that the running of the angels are... It represents their sort of loss in identity. They're, they're being consumed on high, losing their all, all sense of existence. And the return of the angels is the return to that sense of self as an independent entity. So in other words, the idea of the angels are they're constantly um, ascending and descending. Ascending in the sense that they are uh, not in existence of themselves. They become completely unified in the existence of God and then keep returning to that, that they are their own sort of independent existence. But it's this constant yearning, the angels have this constant yearning to be consumed, be a part of the divine, and then they return to be their own independent entity. I've, I've told you this um, several times before in different contexts. Um, as some of you may know, I'm a, an Eagle Scout, a Boy Scout, I was a Boy Scout. Um, and when you are sitting around a campfire, one sort of interesting thing that you'll notice is if you have a small fire, like a match or a candle, and you put it near the bonfire, the small fire kind of wants to jump in to the big fire. Kind of way that it works. It's, it almost wants to be like consumed back in its, its source in the big fire. That's what it appears to. And the angel is sort of like that existence where it wants to constantly be reconsumed in the you know, uh, unified presence of God and the unified existence of God and, and keeps going in and out of existence, becoming its own entity, but wanting desperately to go up. And then it, it, that's, that is how it's described in Kabbalistic literature that the angel is constantly uh, running and returning. Now, the question is, and this is a famous question in Jewish philosophy, is why does God even bother with angels? They seem kind of unnecessary, right? There's God in the world. Like, what do you need angels for? So the answer to this philosophical question has been addressed in several places in Jewish literature. Okay? It seems kind of unnecessary. Just, okay, there's God, there's the world. So one of the pillars of the Jewish faith is that God is absolute unity. God is absolute oneness in every sense. 
God's essence cannot be dissected, it cannot be analyzed or broken up into different parts. God is ultimately one. That being so, how does God interact with a multifarious world? With a world that is composed of many parts. And so the mystics explain that it's for this reason that God made the spiritual realms as a means of channeling his providence to the world. In other words, when God wants to express God's self to creation, he created a system that sort of coarsens that unique, indivisible um, oneness of energy. This is a way that it can be felt and perceived and experienced by creation. A whole channel, a whole system that get from infinite God to being able to understand that and comprehend that by a human being with their five senses. So it's in the spiritual domain, right? It's, the spiritual domain is kind of like a computer program, right? The universe, all, all the spiritual universe, all the spiritual universes, and even the physical universe is sort of like a computer program that, was, uh, that is constantly being operated by a computer programmer, right? Um, and ultimately, all of the channels of God's will, everything that God wants to direct towards the physical world to creation, it's carried, these, these mechanisms, these spiritual worlds, carry down God's um, uh, either blessings or God's communication to the world below. Jewish literature describes the whole system of processing the, this ethereal, uh, you know, spiritual energy to be processed into a physical world, a physical way uh, that, it, that it can be understood, it can be felt, it can be seen, it can be touched by a human being, by a, by a, uh, a flesh and blood be being. Okay, and so the there are gradations of perception as, as, you, as, as you move uh, sort of away from God and uh, move closer relatively speaking, to the physical world, right? There's it be slowly become this, this energy, this blessing, uh, this divine message or divine communication becomes more coarsened. And so the there's these gradations of perception where the infinite divine energy is coarsened in such a way that it can be perceived by us lower entities. So the first purpose of angels, the first purpose is to be the mechanism in which the, uh, the, inf the infinite energy of God, in which God's infinity can be channeled and processed to the world. Right? So if anyone ever asked, what's the deal with angels? Why do we need angels? Angels are the primary mechanism in which God's infinity is conveyed and conferred to the world. All right. So when the Talmud says that every word emanating from God creates an angel, it doesn't mean that there's a bunch of winged babies flying out of God's mouth. God doesn't have a mouth. God doesn't produce winged babies when he speaks. The idea of an angel being created every time God speaks means that this is a force which emanates in order to become manifest in the physical world. It's like a spiritual reverberation, of, of spiritual uh, sound waves for lack of a better term. So angels are the means which bring the, which bring the divine effulgence down into this world, right? allowing God's blessings to be expressed in a physical way. Now, it should be known, by the way, this is parenthetically very secret Kabbalistic information, so I hope all of you are listening very closely. Don't tell anybody, I, or just, okay? But parenthetically, in the gradation of, of spiritual worlds, getting from, again, the infinite divine uh, energy to a physical world, there's gradations, right? There's a whole gradation, a whole system of angels, and which just means different ways of coarsening that energy. But the next rung down after the angels, it says that the, the, um, the blessings and the energies are, are conveyed to the world through the astrological influences. So the angels are that which coarsens enough, and then, it's, then it is, then it is uh, 
the next uh, form of transference is to the astrological powers, which, you know, again, bring it down uh, into, into the reality. So it's for this reason, actually, that uh, in some sources, in some places, uh, the stars are called, the, excuse me, the angels are, are called the souls of the stars. Interesting. Right? So they're the next more coarsened mechanism to implement divine energy in a physical way. Right? So there's a whole gradation system getting from infinite God, right? The blessings and the, and the, just the communication of an infinite God to a finite world. Lots of steps in between. Now, let, let's make it even more practical. Okay, because we, we find this on a very human level as well, right? This interaction that God is having with humanity, with our world, can actually be compared to the interaction between two individuals, right? We're going to use this as a comparison. I think this will actually bring even more clarity to this interaction, all right? So let's say an individual has a feeling. A person has a feeling, right? And this feeling is a simple, lofty, non-quantifiable feeling, right? Perhaps the person feels inside of themselves tremendous love. They have, they have this feeling that they're full of love for someone else, okay? Now, when you're full of that feeling, you're full of this tremendous love, the only way that you can express your innermost feeling, right? The feeling, you can't touch the feeling. You can't hold the feeling. The feeling isn't consisting of many parts. It's one simple, special, lofty, ethereal feeling that you have inside. You, can't, you don't say like, oh, I'm gonna give half my love to you and half my love. You can't break it up. It's one single unified entity. And so this unified entity, this spiritual feeling, for lack of a better term, right, the only way that you can express these innermost feelings that you have to another person is through the use of your limbs, through the use of your mouth, through, or through other mechanisms, right? A person expresses their love for another person by embracing them, right, with a hug or with a kiss, by speaking words of endearment, perhaps presenting a gift, these are ways in which a person conveys that simple, unified, ethereal love that we have inside. There's no other way to communicate it. You could feel it as much as you want, and you have these powerful feelings of love, but unless you communicate it, no one else is going to know about it. Unless you tell that person, unless you show that person, the other person appreciates the gesture of a hug. Why? Because it shows that you care. If you think about it, it doesn't even make sense, right? You just, I feel loved. Why? I feel now the feeling that you're feeling. Why? Because you put your arms around me. It doesn't even make any sense. You put your lips on my cheek. Now I feel, but, but, but. At the end of the day, that mechanism accurately conveys the message that you want it to convey. If someone gives you a half hug or a backhanded kiss, like, mm, 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 you know, it's like your, your feelings are also being conveyed very clearly. So it's not about the action per se, but the feeling itself is only conveyed through external mechanisms. So you have this simple, very powerful energy inside of you, very powerful feeling, and you want to give it over, you want to express it. There's no way that you can express that without proper mechanisms. And if you don't know, if you don't know the proper mechanisms, the other person's not going to know how to relate to it. If you're just like, Aah! right? If you're just like, you just, you know, you're that, that energy just gets inside of you, you just like spit it out, the person's going to be like, Whoa, get away. You know, like they're not going, it's not going to be received well. And so it works in a similar way with, with infinite divine energy, God conveying God's self to creation. If God exposed God's self in his ultimate sense, we would just explode. We, we, don't, have, we don't have the capacity. We don't have, we're not vessels. We're not receptacles 
that can process that complete revelation. If you just describe your feelings in ways that are mechanisms that are not palatable or not understandable by another person, they're not going to understand. They're not going to appreciate what you're trying to say. You're just like, ugh, ugh, you know, like, and just let the love come out in, in some, you know, crazy way. It's not going to be processed properly. And so it has to be done with mechanisms and a whole system of ways in which you process that divine uh, uh, incorporeal feeling that you have when you want to transfer it to another. So this is, this is the idea of angels. Angels are part of that mechanism. They are the mechanism that the incorporeal feeling, the, the love is expressed, right? When, and when talking about God, it's, it's the same way, right? It's through the mechanism of the angels, right, in the gradations of the spiritual worlds, which convey that which God wants to bestow upon the world. That's the idea of angels. That's the first reason that there's angels. The second purpose of the angels is going in the opposite direction, is to convey human thought and human feeling towards God, which allows the, that the commandments which human beings perform to be received and perceived on high. The Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, writes as follows. He says, just as there are angels who are emissaries from on high to transmit the divine flow downwards, there are also angels who, who receive the Jewish people's deeds and feelings and bring them before God. And this is what the Zohar means, that angels receive the prayers. What does that mean, angels receive the prayers? Right, Since it's not possible that physical sounds and physical words ascend to heaven and become, this, right, become, become one with their source, how could physical things become one with, the, with, a spiritual, with their spiritual source? This is the, they undergo the refinement through the processing of the angels. So again, the angels are the channels which bring divine energy downward and bring our mitzvah observances, our feelings, our prayers upwards. It's what translates the spiritual realms into the physical and what translates the physical realm back into the spiritual. So it's also along these lines, by the way, that the Medrash says that when one performs a mitzvah, that person is given an angel. And when a person does two mitzvahs, it says that they get two angels. And the Medrash continues and says, a person who performs all of the commandments is given many, many angels, like Ron, lots of angels. So the Medrash continues, <laughs> the Medrash continues and says, and this is, this is something interesting to think about, the Medrash continues and says, who are these angels? Who are these angels? What are these angels? It says they are the ones who guard a person against harm. They guard a person against harm. In addition to being a communicatory um, mechanism, something that just communicates divine energy down and communicates human energy upward, they act as a positive energy of sorts that results from the performance of the commandments. And it's very likely that it's from this idea, this medrash, right, that a person is guarded by them, that the concept, the idea of guardian angels came about. The fact that the Medrash says that when a person does a mitzvah, they're granted an angel. And who are these angels, the ones that guard them from harm? It's very likely that the concept of having a guardian angel came from this idea. Well, let's talk a little bit about the angelic gradations, just briefly for a moment. The sages write that there are a many... After. Yeah, the, the, the sages write that there are different gradations. They mention 10 in particular, gradations of angels. They're classified by their divine perception and refinement. So there are higher angels that are more refined and closer to God in that sense. And then there are angels that are less refined, that are more, more, more closely um, uh, related to the physical world, that, that are the, maybe the main ones that bring the divine information from the spiritual to the physical world. Right? The Rambam lists 10 different classifications of angels. The 10th 
and the lowest is called Ishim. Right? That's the name of that's the name of this grouping of angels. Ishim, who communicate they're Ishim because Ish Ish means man, right? They're called Ishim because these are the ones, these are the, the spiritual existences that communicate with the prophets and are perceived through prophetic vision. That's why they're called Ishim, meaning men, because their level is close to the level that a, a person, even a very refined person, can have uh, a, 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 a purview to. Okay, so, so uh, okay, it can be privy to that. Okay, so in the biblical text, angels are, are mentioned outright, right? The biblical text speaks explicitly about angels. They appear to Hagar in the Bible. They appear to Lot, right, to Lot. Um, there's three angels that appear to Abraham, right? An angel saves Isaac from being slaughtered. They are described as ascending and descending the ladder, a Jacob's dream, Jacob's ladder. Um, they, there's an angel that wrestles with Jacob, right, and gives him a new name. Uh, God promises that he's going to send one to Moses, um, and he sends one to stand in the way of, of Bilaam. So uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg in the dozens of references to angels that we see uh, in the biblical text, outright in the biblical text. Now, the true purpose of the angels is for the glorification of God, right? Uh, again, we said, number one, it's there for, uh, it's being used as a way of divine communication to us, but it's there to sort of give extra glory to God, the King of Kings, right? The more magnificent the monarch, the greater their entourage. So the, the existence of angels, of these spiritual entities, also gives extra glory uh, to God. Now, when were the angels created? When were angels created? So the, some sages in our tradition say that it was on the second day of creation, while others say that it was on the fifth day of creation. That's what our sages teach. That's what Talmud writes. Right? Um, all the classical sources agree that it was not on the first day of creation, and the reason being that it shouldn't appear that they were helping in the creation process. That they are creations, they are separate things. Um, and and the, the Kabbalists actually clarify this idea. What does it mean that they were created on the second day and the fifth day? Like, what? pick one, which one was it? So the, the Kabbalists write that there are two different types of angels. There are temporary angels, Right, the ones that are in existence for one single purpose and then they're finito. And then there are permanent angels, angels that are kind of uh, permanent messengers of conveying a certain uh, divine blessing, divine effulgence to the world. So the temporary ones, it says, were created on the second day, and the permanent ones who have names, right, uh, they're the ones that were created on the fifth day. That's what it teaches in various places uh, in Jewish tradition. Now, there are types of angels, right? These types of angels, the two types of angels, um, the Talmud says that there are ministering angels. They're created, it says, from a stream of fire, whatever. And again, that's anthropomorphic language. And after they sing their praises to God, they sort of just cease to exist. So in other words, every single day, we pray three times a day, and the angels in the heavens also pray. They also are, are there to sort of, um, you know, acknowledge and, and express the glory of the king. And those angels are temporarily there. They're just, they, they are in a form of praise, and then they, poof, they're out of existence just as easily as they came into existence. Um, and then other angels don't cease to exist, right? These are angels like Malach Machal, right? The, the angel Michael, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel, they, uh, who are permanently residents, for lack of a better term, in the heavens and offer continual praises and are continual uh, mechanisms that God uses in order to convey certain uh, divine energy to the world. Now, angels continuously bask in the splendor of God's divine presence. They're not subject to our evil inclinations. They're not subject to any evil inclination. They have no free will. Angels don't eat, they don't drink, they don't have bodily needs. They're not like a human being in that sense. The Talmud teaches that it was Michael, Michal, right, Gavriel, Gabriel, and Raphael, Raphael, who visited Abraham, who visited Abraham, um, and 
and they typically are the angels that carry out uh, one mission at a time. In fact, angels in general typically carry out one individual mission at a time. Since there were three things that needed to be done uh, for Abraham, right, or for, for, for the world, they, there were three different angels working in different capacities to do such a thing. So angels and human beings are actually said to be alike, have three similar qualities in the sense that both have understanding, right, albeit on different levels. Uh, both walk upright, and, uh, and that means that they have the uh, capacity for doing what's right, right, and both speak the holy tongue. That, those are the three, uh, three similarities that the Talmud, the Gemara and Chagiga, mentions in comparing angels and people. Now, the first mention of any angelic name, names-wise, right, in the biblical context is in the book of Daniel. Right? However, at the same time, rabbinic lore is full of names and descriptions of angels. And the mystics actually caution uh, against the person mentioning the names of angels haphazardly. Like they're holy names. You don't just you know, talk about them uh, in, a, non in, a, in an, a way that's not respectable. So the Torah literature speaks of four main angelic beings which correspond to the four divisions of encampments that the Israelites are described as camping in the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. Right? It says that they would camp in four different like segments. The number four in general is, is seen as, um, as a special number. It's a number that represents the place in which existence finds expression. Four represents how existence finds expression. It's the medium upon which the foundation lies, right? There's like four corners to a building, right? Four, like that's typically how a building is built. Uh, there, the, the world, in fact, is on a map is drawn in four directions, four part, you know, four directions on a compass. Um, there are, that this is, this is sort of the way that it, that it works, the idea. Um, we're not going to go too much into the angelic names. Um, there are, there are, there are described in various places, um, you know, by their names and what their individual functions are. If we went through all of them, we would be here, um, you know, probably through the week. Um, so uh, we will we will save that perhaps for another time. Going through each angel, what it's is it's it's not it's not all that relevant as we're going to uh, uh, continue to say. There are a few people in Jewish history, interestingly enough that Jewish tradition describes them as actually becoming an angel. Uh, very few. It's not, it's not a, this is not a normal thing. But examples are Hanoich, right, who is called like uh, Enoch in the Bible, at right, the beginning of the book of Bereshis, the beginning of Genesis. It says that he became Malach Matat. Uh, Elijah the prophet is connected with, with an angel, becoming an angel. And also, some sources list Moses in the angelic category as well. These are unique cases. This is not, again, a normal circumstance to happen, but it's, there are places that, ha that mentions that it has happened before. Now, what about angels appearing? So the, the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, writes something interesting. He says, any time that the Bible uh, speaks about people seeing angels, it's referring to... Uh, like having in a, in a vision, right? Not physically, they don't phys that, that it's in a vision because angels, being that they are spiritual entities, they can't be seen. This is what the Rambam says. So when the angels come to comfort Abraham, for example, the Rambam would suggest that it wasn't in a literal sense. It was something that he was able to link into by divine perception, divine intuition. The Ramban, right, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, also a famed medieval scholar, he strongly disagrees and says the details of the narrative in the Bible would seem kind of meaningless if they never happened in some sort of physical sense. Right? If the angels were just a vision, did Lot and his family like never leave Sodom? Did they never leave Sodom? Because an angel takes them out and they, right, don't look back, the whole, the whole thing. Did they never leave? Was that all just allegory? Was, all that, was that all just in a vision or in a dream? So the Ramban explains that angels in general, yes, they, do not, they don't have a physical image and, and there's nothing that can describe them. 
However, the, that, that um, when angels are described as appearing in the Bible, they do take on some sort of bodily form, like a human component. They don't, again, no, no wing, no wing babies, no halos, none of that, none of that stuff. But there is a physical component. They do, they, they do assume physical form in those instances. This is the, Ram, the Ramban. And it seems that the, the mainstream thought tends to follow the idea of the Ramban. That in the Bible, you know, again, like, did, did they never leave Zdoim? Did they never leave Sodom? No, it happened. It, it happened. But just when, again, 99.9% .9 of the time, right, when, an, when an angel, when a malach is described, we're, we're talking about something in, only in the spiritual realms. But if the Bible, if the Torah itself is actually describing that they did a specific mission on planet Earth, like taking Lot and his family out of Sodom, then that was, that was meant in a physical way that they had some sort of physical form that they had uh, come into at that, at that particular moment. Now, angels are refined spiritual beings, right? They are refined spiritual entities. But at the end of the day, we always have to remember that they are created entities just like a tree and just like a rock. So again, they are much more spiritual. They're much more refined and uplifted. But at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, they are just as much a creation as a tree or a rock. And so prayer directed towards angels is forbidden. Just like we're not allowed to pray to a tree or to a rock, asking a tree or a rock for our sustenance, we, we don't ask angels for, for, for direct to, to, uh, prayers to them as, as well. Excuse me. There are at the same time, though, there are at the same time several instances in Jewish literature and Jewish prayer where it seems that angels uh, can at least be involved in our supplications to God. They like loosely involved in our prayers to God. Okay, so there's an interesting discussion as to whether a person is allowed to beseech angels to intercede on our behalf. In other words, can you ask, can you say, angels, please intercede? Uh, that we should be remembered by God for good. Right? Some sources in Jewish tradition teach that a person may pray for help, you know, from the, with the help of, pray for help, the help of the uh, administering angels to, to strengthen my power to pray, right? Help me pray that I should pray strongly to God. Um, there have been prayers that have been composed throughout the ages that also seem to recognize and utilize this line of thinking. There are those from the Rishonim, the early sages, um, who defend this practice of, of asking angels to intercede with God. Um, other authorities are much more hesitant to condone this type of behavior. Um, for example, the, the Abarbanel, one of the later authorities, uh, he, say, he cites a Talmudic reference. He says, that it, it quotes from the, the Talmud, the Gemara and Yushalmi, it says that if the Jews, this is God talking, if the Jews face hardship, they should not cry out to the angels, Michael and Gabriel, right? Michal and Gabriel. Rather, I, God, should receive their outcries. So in other words, like, even if it's something that's technically permissible, it's something that is uncommon, something that really shouldn't be uh, utilized all that much, um, unless, unless there has, has been a, an accepted prayer, perhaps, that in which this is done. And again, then it would be written with the proper authority and context that it's meant to be uh, written with. But otherwise, if it's, but, but, but in general uh, speak, you know, all of our prayers should be directed, addressed directly to God. Right? Why send to a P.O. box when you can send directly to the address itself? Okay? Now, interestingly enough, there is a prayer, there is a song, actually, that's sung... Uh, you know, after synagogue every Friday night, prior to you know making kiddush on on wine Friday night, the, the song is is it's uh, was composed by the Kabbalists in the 17th century, and it's accepted by all communities. The Shalom Aleichem prayer, right? Shalom Aleichem. I'm not going to uh, indulge you with my singing of the whole song, but um, but the idea is that again, you have here a song you know, welcoming the angels. So the reason that it was adapted is based on the Talmudic description of, of the Shabbos evening. It says that when a person comes home from shul, they're accompanied by two angels. One of them is a positive force. One of them is a negative force. And when they come home, 
the first thing at the, you know, when, when, when they appear uh, in their house and come home and the candles are lit and the Shabbos table is set, the beds are made and everything looks nice, right? The good angel said it should be like this every week and the bad angel is supposed to concede and say, Amen. But if the candles are not lit and the table is not set and the, the whole house is in disarray and chaos, right? The bad angel says, oh, it should be like this every night. And then the good angel says, Amen. So the idea is that these angels, the song of Shalom Aleichem is the greeting that is sung to welcome these ministering angels. Not praying to them. It's not, it's not incorporating them in our prayer. It's just greeting these angels, these spiritual entities that are accompanying us home from Shul. Now, typically, the song is sung with four stanzas. Typically. The first two welcome the angels, right? Shalom Aleichem, right? Right? Bayachem, right? right? Well, you know, uh, so this is about welcoming the angels. The third stanza asks the angels for blessings, Baruchuni L'Shalom, right? And the fourth stanza sends them away, right? Tzeschem, right? All right, we've had enough, right? Go ahead, be on your way, right? So some of the sages actually omitted, right? Some of the sages in the last few centuries omitted the third stanza of Baruchuni L'Shalom, right? Bless me with, bless me angels, right? Instead of, because, right, in their view, it's inappropriate to request from an angel a blessing, right? It seems to be, it seems to resemble like praying to the angels, which Judaism forbids. However, most Jewish sages say that this has nothing to do with praying to angels. In fact, when Jacob, our forefather, was wrestling with the angel, right, and and the, the angel is trying to get away. Jacob says, I'm not going to let you get away until you bless me. Right? So we have an open source, an open, clear time where, where this is something that is, you know, a, a, a formidable practice. So, again, there are, say, and then there are, community, there are communities that, again, that this is not, uh, that they don't say it, they admit it, and they're, they're welcome to that, have that view, and that's an acceptable view. But for, for the most part, um, worldwide amongst Jewish communities, all four stanzas are accepted and sung. Um, so let's talk about angels and humans. The holiness of the Jewish soul, of a human being's soul, far exceeds that of angels, far outshines that of the angels. Angels are one-dimensional. Angels are one-dimensional, only performing one specific task. They have one job to do, and they do that job. The human soul can serve in a variety of ways. We can serve God in a variety of ways. We can serve through love, through awe, through compassion. The many ways in which the human soul can, can be of service. It's only the soul... The soul is the only thing in the entire universe that is described as an actual piece of God, right? Being created in the Tzelem Elikim, in the, in the divine uh, image. The angels are just a part of creation. We are a piece, we are a part of our creator. The soul is a piece of the creator, not a piece of creation. So although an angel might be high, might be lofty, might be spiritual, might be special, it's a part of creation. The human soul is a piece of the divine. So in fact, the Madras writes that there were a group of angels. Anyone ever, there, there's, a, there's a big misconception. You know, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshis, talks about these uh, giants, the sons of God that married the daughters of man and that they you know, made giants and they called them Nephilim. A lot of people are very puzzled. What are these Nephilim characters? Some people, you know, there's all sorts of different theories out there as what the Nephilim are. Well, one of the, one of the ideas in Judaism about the Nephilim, the Medrash says something interesting. It says that there were a certain group of angels that wanted to serve God in a better way. They saw, look, the human beings get to serve God in such a special way, in a multifarious way. We're just limited to this one way. I wish, I wish, wish, wish that we could go down there and serve God like the human beings serve God. They wanted to uplift themselves to the level of the human being. Think about that. 
They wanted to become higher. They wanted to, to, to become more spiritual. And so they wanted to be on the level of the human being. And they begged God to allow them to try out mortal life. Now, upon being put in a body, though, when they got put in a body, they couldn't help but to succumb to the temptations that were experienced by mor- and they had moral failings. And these are the Nephilim, right? The fallen, the Nephilim means the fallen ones that are discussed in the book of Genesis. That's one of the ways in which they are described in Jewish tradition. The Magister says that. There are other ways in which it's described, but this is one of the ways. So it's not like the angels are up here and the humans are here. In, in, it's much more accurate, conceptually, say that the human being is the pinnacle. Why? Because the human soul is a piece of the divine. It's a piece of the creator, not a part of creation. <laughs> Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, the, the Alter Rebbe, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, says that if an angel were to stand in the presence of a gathering of ten Jews, even if there were no words of Torah being discussed amongst the ten Jews, right, such boundless and infinite terror, dread would fall upon them, right, on, on, on the amount of, divi- amount of the intensity of the divine presence that would be abiding over them, that the angel would become completely nullified would become completely annulled. It would cease to exist because the divine energy of 10 Jews standing together, a minion standing together, is so powerful, there's so much divine energy there that no angel stands a chance. So angels, we have to remember, they are pre-programmed entities. Angels don't have their own free will. They have no independent identities. Right? There's, there's no side agendas, there's no egos, there's no, in, they are just a caveat, just a mechanism to transferring the divine energy to the physical world, or vice versa. They fulfill the will of their creator. So on the one hand, this is special, because their entire existence is in sync with what they were created for. Right? They only do what God wants them to do. That's, that's on one hand, that's good. On the other hand, their service is very limited and in a sense valueless because they had no other choice but to do the godly thing. It's not like they chose to do the right thing. They, it was what they were pre-programmed to do. It's like a robot doing it. They can't choose to go against God or they can't choose to do what's for God. They can only do what God wants. So the fact that a robot does what they're supposed to do, what they were programmed to do, is no big, no, there's no novelty to that. On the one hand, it's nice. It did what it's supposed to do. Good. But what's, okay, so what's the great accomplishment? Right? It's for this reason, by the way, that sometimes the angels are referred to as chayats, which literally means animals. Right? They share a commonality with animals right? in that they can't transcend their nature. They can only do that which they were programmed to do, only that which their nature tells them to do. Right? It's, a, it's a much more refined level of nature than an animal, let's say, but at the end of the day, they're just doing that which they're programmed to do. And so the accomplishment of the human being is a much more precious thing than the service of the angels. What a human being chooses to do the right thing, that is way more special than an angel doing the right thing. It's for this reason that the topic of angels in general in Judaism is kind of a peripheral topic. You don't really, we don't really talk about angels all that much. They're kind of like referenced here and there in the Torah portion maybe or you know, in our prayers. But it's not like a primary topic right? because they have very little practical relevance to us. In fact, many times in Hasidic texts, when angels are discussed, it's simply to show how utterly insignificant their accomplishments are in relation to a human being. The reality is that their service is supremely deficient in comparison to that which a human being can attain. We are much higher. We are much better. The angels would give anything to be able to attain what a human being can. 
All of the upper worlds were only created as a mechanism to connect human action with the divine. All the in-between worlds are just a means to an end. All the spiritual realms, all the angels, all, all the forces that are between the infinite God and creation are just a means to an end, just a mechanism. The pinnacle of creation is the human being. When a human being does what they need to do, we accomplish higher than any angel. So the human being can choose to live with the spiritual awareness of an animal, right, and just go by their animalistic tendencies, their base natures, their bodily instincts, or they can choose to do that of an angel and try to ascend higher to God. And when the human being, though, chooses the perception of the angel, his divine service and achievement is much more valuable than even the highest angel. So we'll leave with that concept. Each one of us in this room, through the mechanism of the commandments, has a way in which to connect to God greater than anything in the entire universe. The highest of angels, the greatest of all other creations, the planets and the solar systems and the, the galaxies, the universe itself is only a mechanism, is only a tool so that we should be able to serve God, to serve the divine. And every time that we do a mitzvah, every time we choose the right thing, we create an angel. And the more good things that we do, the more angels we create. The more protection, divine energy exudes from us. A lot of times, <clears throat> a lot of times you'll meet someone that's really full of mitzvahs, and their face just kind of shines with mitzvah. Their face shines with goodness. Sometimes. So let's utilize this tremendous power that we have to connect to God higher and, a, and a better than anything else in all of creation, and in doing so, uplift not only all of, not only uplift ourselves and all of the physical world, but uplift all the spiritual worlds, all the angels, and make this whole universe a place that can reflect and radiate the divine. Have a wonderful night. We'll see everybody real soon. Again, if you're listening for the first time, we do this every Monday night, 7.30 Eastern Daylight Savings Time, right here at facebook.com forward slash Pinchas Taylor. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, first give us a like, a share, and then uh, feel free to comment and ask any questions, and I'll do my best to respond to everybody. Have a great night, and God willing, we'll see you all soon.